We are here with Professor Dale Murphy from the Dubai School of Government and we'll be talking about the regulatory framework that's going to help enhance the entrepreneurial landscape in the Middle East. Thank you very much indeed for joining us, Dale. My pleasure. May I call you Dale, first of all? Of course. <laughs> okay, we're talking about the regulatory framework and you're particularly involved in seeing that from a government perspective, the framework in the Middle East, the ecosystem in the Middle East, enables entrepreneurs to start businesses and to flourish and to grow. Can you talk a little bit about what kind of... Uh, laws or what kind of policies are being put in place to enable that? Sure, with pleasure. Um, first, I have to say how exciting it is to be here at the Celebration of Entrepreneurship. Um, there's just so much going on. It's just uh, really energizing for everyone, I think. And my particular take on this is we now have hundreds of initiatives, uh, many of them represented here, encouraging a new generation of entrepreneurs in the Middle East. And uh, with any due luck, we'll have a new generation of successful business coming online in the next you know, five years or less. Um, so my interest now is the policies that affect them. And we know, just to give you a really quick, easy example that people I think can grasp onto, that it's very difficult to start a company. So despite the best help and practices, maybe 70% of new companies do not last beyond three years. Right. Um, of those, some percentage, maybe 10%, will end up insolvent. Uh, they'll owe more than their assets. And in many countries in the region now, if you are insolvent, you can face jail time. Uh, so that's a serious impediment. The good news is I think most governments in the region now are aware that this is a disincentive to the risk that's required to take a, a new uh, venture to market. And I think you see a lot of reforms underway. Um, so the, the, the progress towards decriminalizing bankruptcy, I think you'll, you'll see in, in many countries in the region. I know in Dubai it's been looked at over the last three years. I think there's, there's progress underway now. In Abu Dhabi there's a new law being discussed about um, insolvency reforms for SMEs, which I think is very encouraging. Uh, you've seen reforms in Egypt on this. It requires a uh, bankruptcy court, trained judges, trained accountants, trained lawyers, you know, so it can't be done overnight. But I, I think the message for you know, youth and, and the new generation of entrepreneurs is governments are responding uh, to the, the recommendations and the, the perceived need uh, of these policy reforms that will uh, enhance the environment for them. So that's, that's one quick example. Do we, do we know why companies are failing in those, in, the, in those large numbers? Is it about credit lines? Is it about access to funding? Is it, just, just, is it about management? What, what, what are the, kind of the, the key problems that, that startup businesses are facing to lead to a 70% failure well, in three years? That, that number is international. Uh, even in the best environments. Uh, in, in the U.S., it's, it's the same number. Um, it's just hard to start a new company and get off the ground. Um, so here in the region, I don't think it's uh, any higher. If anything, it might be lower um, uh, than that number. It's just the, the impediment at the end. It's actually, you know, it, it, failure isn't simply a social disgrace. It's actually a criminal, a criminal offense. Can be, can be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that's such a, you know, such a wrong incentive uh, for entrepreneurs. But I, I, you know, I, I think people have gotten the idea, but now it's a question of implementing it. So you, you, need, you need the train, you know, court proceedings to, to enable this. Where uh, are we along in the process, would you say, give an assessment of like, the, you know, when did you start this, when did you start your involvement in this work and how far along are we in, in terms of where we would like to be in, in, in a reasonable time frame? The, the, the speed of change is breathtaking. Uh, I mean, I, I, it blows my mind how fast, I, I've never seen such fast policy change anywhere in the world. So I, I've been in Dubai, I first came here June 2008. Um, so not long, I mean two years. Yeah, 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 no, yeah. two years, exactly. And, uh, you know, changes uh, here in the UAE, across the region, I mean, um, uh, Jordan just uh, nearly removed its, or it's about to remove its minimal capital requirements, down to one dinar. Um, UAE has, has dramatically lowered its minimum capital requirements. Saudi Arabia has made dramatic changes in the last five years. Uh, inside Saudi Arabia, it's now ranked uh, number one in the region by the World Bank's Doing Business uh, Unit. So I, I think uh, I would never have guessed how rapidly we would see change uh, in the two years that I've been here. And I, that change is, is you know, growing in, uh, astronomically, yeah. um, exponentially. I Looking at the numbers that are here today, looking at the, the startups from across the region, looking at the ideas that are being turned into successful ventures, it wouldn't necessarily seem that the regulatory environment right now is a disincentive. I mean, how, how, are, how is the growth of entrepreneurship activity and regulation tied? I th would like to think it's a, a beneficent cycle, uh, and I, I think it's the case. Um, the, the challenge in entrepreneurship policy is it's not just one policy, it's, uh, it's not just a hundred, it's a thousand or ten thousand small regulations that affect uh, different entrepreneurs in different ways. And there's typically no unifying body that represents the voice of entrepreneurs. So you'll have chambers of commerce and they're, they, you know, they generally like entrepreneurs, but they also represent large existing firms. Um, there's no ministry for entrepreneurship here in the region. And I only know of a few worldwide in Scandinavia, they're, they're exploring this idea um, at a ministerial level. So uh, th there's, you know, 
thousands of these small regulations that can inhibit uh, different firms in, in, in different ways, labor regulations, financial, um, uh, educational policies that sort of shape the ability of, of youth to come up with these ideas and start these new companies. Um, but I think that, the, to answer your question, that the growth of entrepreneurial firms in the region now is spreading awareness of the need to reform and to adopt best practices in entrepreneurship policy that will enable them. And it's a, a sort of grassroots uh, policy reform, I don't want to use the word movement, but um, um, spread. I mean, that, that's, yeah. these are just spreading sort of you know, word of mouth. Yeah. I'm not aware of any you know, sort of organized top-down group, but there, there's articles on Wikipedia. If you Google for um, entrepreneurship policies in UAE, you'll see a, a Wikipedia article that anyone can contribute to. Sure. I mean, it's a slightly philosophical question. How much can a regulatory environment actually help change, create a different culture? Mm -hmm. Can, you know, can a change in the legal framework actually lead people to, you know, to create a culture whereby entrepreneurship is seen as not only viable but attractive? It's a good question, and I would say it, it has to be a, a, a hand-in-glove relationship. Uh, you, you can't pull the entrepreneurs to regulation. You can't sort of uh, impose laws that will create them. You can create an enabling environment, but you need the events like, you know, WAMDA and Celebration of Entrepreneurship and all the, you know, hundreds and now probably thousands of initiatives here that are encouraging entrepreneurs to start the training programs, educational programs, mentor programs. That's where it, it comes from. And the, and the demand, I think, for regulatory reform has to come from those entrepreneurs. So they need to speak up and let the, the regulators, the policymakers, the researchers know about the policies that they're bumping into. Um, and that's how you, you'll, you'll see the regulatory change. I think it's a very important point as well when you, look across the middle, when you look across the Middle East and the nature of government that we have. It's not just about institution building. It, it's about, it is about that. It's about creating the infrastructure that's going to help and support startup business, but it's also about removing the government hand in certain areas. Is that happening across the region that you can see that, that, you can, that these, things are, these things are going in parallel? Sure, yeah, I mean, and, you know, each country, of course, is, is different when you yeah. get into specifics, but um, I, I have a, a group of uh, some of my former students from Syria here who are interested in entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship policies, uh, and you see sort of the, the, the Syrian uh, transition into what, what they're calling market socialism and sort of their, their exploration of, of more market reforms. So many countries in the region, I think, are, are engaging in pretty broad-based uh, market reforms, which include, you know, sometimes it's deregulation in the sense of getting rid of the unnecessary steps to register a company, removing the red tape, uh, creating not only a, um, a one-stop shop, but then re reducing the number of barriers once you go to that shop, shop or a, a, a one-window shop, or even a, an online uh, registration process to get, get rid of the unnecessary red, red tape. But there are cases also where you need uh, stronger government regulation, let's say to enforce um, anti-competition laws, um, uh, antitrust laws. Antitrust laws, yeah. Competition policy laws um, to make sure there's no monopoly power, sort of improper market power being influenced to allow smaller companies to come in and, and actually compete. So there you need the, the, you know, the, the imprint of government to enable entrepreneurs. So it's both a, a positive uh, step in, and removing the, the barriers to... And things like contract enforcement. I mean, there's nothing more frustrating in, in any business environment. You do $100,000 of work, but you've only been paid for 10000 That's going to ruin your cash flow. I mean, that's got to be a strong part of any regulatory framework. Absolutely. Just creating a, you know, a fundamental rule of law is, is a, a basic uh, step for any entrepreneur to, like you say, to sign a contract, make sure it will be enforced, um, and it can be on any side of, of the, the equation. You can be uh, you know, an employee who has a contract with, with the firm and, and expects it to be enforced. You can be an employer who maybe who has uh, your employees sign a non-disclosure agreement or a non-compete agreement uh, that they will uh, entrust you, uh, you will trust them with, with your secret to, as the entrepreneur. And you don't want them to take your idea and run to a different country outside the, the rule of law of wherever you're working. So that, that uh, rule of law and the enforcement of, of contracts, the enforcement of property rights, including intellectual property intellectual rights. Intellectual property is very yeah, important. Yeah. Very important, yeah. Okay, good. Um, another, another point. I, I once interviewed uh, Tim Sebastian from the BBC, who uh, made a very, very strenuous point where he said freedom of expression goes hand in hand with entrepreneurship. Would you agree with that? And what is being done to kind of make that connection? In a, legal, in a legal framework? I'm, I'm not as aware as I'd like to of what's going on in terms of legal reforms. Uh, excellent question. In general, I, I tend to agree with his point. Uh, when you're encouraging innovation and creativity, um, you really need to uh, enable the complete free reign of the human mind to explore wherever it wants to go. Um, and I think... Uh, in the early stages, if you're coming from a society in which you have not had that complete freedom of expression, of thought, 
there are some steps that you need to do uh, somewhat gradually, but not too gradually, and that, that's the challenge. People who have not been exposed to that freedom sometimes can abuse it, and, and their, their thoughts go in directions that you know, can harm, harm others or harm society. Um, but when you liberalize over time, then I think uh, those self-defeating uh, ideas uh, weed themselves out, and that's when the real flourishing and, and unleashing of ideas uh, comes from. Um, in terms of, of legal reforms, uh, I, I have not looked into it as much as I should, but I think sure. it's an interesting question. Okay, so if we had a celebration of an entrepreneurship in 2015, what successes and advancements do you think we could be talking about? Wow, on, on the policy front? On the policy front, on the regulatory and policy yeah, front. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hmm. Well, I, I, w I would, you know, like you this. Could, we, could, we, could do, we can do realistic and we can do dream scenario, <laughs> I, either, well, either or. I, I, I tell my students and anyone who listen, uh, you know, I think it's important to think of a policy wish list. Um, you know, ideally, what would you like? Uh, and, and there are some low-hanging fruits that you can change pretty quickly, and others will take more time in building up institutions and getting the agreement of various people on board and so forth. Um, so 2015, that's actually not that far out in, in terms of policy reforms. Um, it's about that time that I think if people started now, you could see the decriminalization of, of insolvency, of administrative reform, make it more of a rational, technocratic uh, economic process, which benefits everyone, allows the capital to be freed up more, gives banks or creditors their, their assets back more, unless the entrepreneurs uh, start a new company. So that, I think, would be a, a, an easy one. Um, you know, e even before that, I, I, there's initiatives that I've, I've just been hearing about the last few days here in Dubai Let's say, uh, look, let's take advantage of Dubai's situation. And, you know, entrepreneurs are always making lemonade from lemons. Um, so there's a, a lot of uh, excess capacity in the real estate markets here. Uh, can we find a way to uh, make use of that for entrepreneurs? Can we have an entrepreneurial lease for a year, in which you're given reduced or zero reduced rent for rights. a year? Um, and, and which we make Dubai not only, you know, the, the best uh, business hub in the region in terms of the quality of telecommunications, transportation, infrastructure, and so forth, but also for young entrepreneurs in particular, it would the be most cost-effective. It would be a magnet for, for regional entrepreneurs It would well. be, a, yeah, just a, a transformation would be really uh, dynamic. And, and, and I, I hear, you know, talk at reasonably high levels of, of this, so. Sure. And you're speaking this week, aren't you? You're speaking? I just spoke this morning. You just spoke this morning? Uh, I'll be on a panel again tomorrow, I think at 3.45, and I have uh, panels on reforms in Syria and Saudi Arabia today. So there's, there's just lots going on in this. Dale Murphy, thank you very much indeed for your time and for speaking to us on WANDA.